taken from the Ultimate Killer Collection, by Stuart Dandel. Leonard Frazier. The Rockhampton Rapist. On the 27th of June, 1951, Leonard John Frazier was born in Ingham, a sugar cane producing community in northern Queensland. He wasn't there long however, the family moved to Mount Druitt when he was just six settling in a brick house on the western side of Sydney's suburbia. His upbringing wasn't particularly eventful by anyone's standards. He was seen as normal by his peers at school, though he couldn't read and write very well and he had trouble academically, but this was hardly the trigger for the vicious serial rapist and murderer that he would become. At the age of 14, Fraser decided he'd had enough of school and drop out. Although he could read by now to a certain degree, he still had issues writing his name. The first inclinations of a troubled mind began when he reached the age of 15 and he developed a penchant for stealing. This drew the ire of the authorities and he was soon sentenced to 12 months in the Gosford Boys' home. Not long after his release from the reformatory, he was bound over for a duration of two years after he assaulted a railway guard. When he then picked up more convictions for stealing cars, driving without a license, and offensive behavior, the bond was withdrawn and he was sentenced to 12 months of hard labor. When he was released after six months, it appears that Leonard Frazier became a one-man crime spree. First he was found guilty of transporting stolen goods, for which he received two years probation. Then just five weeks later, he was caught stealing again and received a couple of weeks in jail. After his stint inside, Frazier was fined $100 for living off the prostitute's earnings, and then eventually, later that year, he received a five-year hard labor sentence in Long Bay Jail, for numerous robbery offenses. Unbeknownst to the sentencing court at the time, Frazier had raped a tourist at the Botanical Gardens two months earlier, and this would begin the trail of his most sickening crimes. Three weeks after Frazier was released, on July the 11th, 1974, he caught sight of a young woman walking alone. It was only 10 a.m. and the woman should have had nothing to fear. Frazier however, had different ideas and he attacked the woman from behind, twisting her arm up behind her back and forcing her down an embankment at the roadside. Once he had the woman at his mercy, Frazier raped her. Strangely, Leonard Frazier thought the woman had enjoyed the experience and he held her hand as he helped her back up onto the road, before making good his escape. Just six days after his vicious attack, Frazier was at the dry cleaners when he felt the urge to attack again. On July the 17th, when the woman who was working alone behind the counter went to find Frazier's dry cleaning, he attacked her from behind and twisted her arm up behind her back. Before he could carry out the sexual aspect of his assault however, some customers arrived and Frazier was forced to flee. Not one to lay low for too long, maybe because of his impulsive behavior, Frazier launched another attack just three days later. He had come across a woman walking along a quiet road at Rudy Hill. After briefly engaging her in conversation, Frazier punched her in the face before twisting her arm behind her back, which was now his signature. He then forced the woman to a nearby creek. All the while the attack was taking place, the woman convinced Frazier that she was attracted to him, and that she indeed wanted to have sex. She eventually convinced him enough, that they set off to Frazier's house holding hands that way they could have the comfort of having sex in his bed. As soon as the woman saw her chance, she broke free from his grip and sprinted for the nearest house, who called the authorities. Due to the fact that he had left his wallet at the scene, Leonard Frazier was caught swiftly and taken into custody. Once under arrest and being interviewed, Frazier happily confessed to his crimes though he denied that he would have had to rape the woman in the dry cleaners if he hadn't been disturbed, stating, I would not have had to force her, she was just about to come across. That sentence along with the hand-holding, 
gives a peculiar insight into Fraser's warped sense of sex and how it transpires. During the confession, Fraser also surprised detectives by admitting to the rape in Sydney's Botanical Gardens two years earlier. The attack had happened as the 37-year-old French tourist, had been visiting the gardens to take pictures while on her way to meet her husband and two young daughters. As she passed some banana trees, a man grabbed her by the neck from behind and punched her repeatedly in the face as he dragged her into the undergrowth near the trees. Once he had her out of sight, he raped her. When he was eventually interrupted by a passerby, the rapist took off with her handbag leaving his semi-conscious victim in a serious condition with multiple fractures to the face and severe shock. Fraser told his interviewers that he had always regretted it and that he was glad to have it off his chest at last. He also went on to explain that he'd had an argument with his flatmate at the time, and that maybe this was the cause. A psychiatrist who interviewed him while he was on remand, revealed that Fraser had been living off prostitutes' proceeds at the time of the tourist rape, though he was not involved sexually with any of them. In fact, Fraser said that he had been involved in numerous homosexual relationships instead. During these conversations he also stated that he would be happy never to see his siblings again, and that he aspired to become a member of the Hells Angels motorcycle gang. An interesting set of details without doubt, though how true to the real Fraser they are, is up for debate. In December of 1974, Leonard Fraser was brought to the Sydney District Court to face trial. He pleaded guilty to two counts of rape, and two counts of attempted rape. During the hearing, the court psychiatrist testified that Fraser has no conscience at all, and that he will use anyone and anything to his advantage without giving a lot of thought to other people's feelings. He has little or no impulse control. Apart from this there is no real psychiatric disability there is no known treatment for this type of psychopathic state. With the psychiatrist's report in mind, Justice Wooten who was proceeding over the case, sentenced Frazier to the maximum of 22 years. Unfortunately the law dictated that his non-parole period could only be set to a maximum of seven years, and so it was. Although in summation, Justice Wooten had this to say. But I wish to make it clear in doing so that I am not in any way suggesting that you should be released at the end of the period. After the sentence was passed down, Fraser's mother Daphne made a statement. I have abandoned him as my son. I know it is a terrible thing to say, but I can rest when he is inside. I go to bed at night and when I hear news of an assault or robbery, I know it will not be Lenny. As appears to be common in the justice system the world over, Justice Wooten's recommendations were ignored when it came to Fraser's release schedule and he was freed in 1981, after the minimum parole period was over. Free to roam wherever he wished, Fraser made his way to Mackay in Queensland, where he found work on the railways as a laborer. It wasn't long however, before he was back to his old criminal ways. In 1982, Fraser approached a woman by feigning interest in a car that she had put up for sale. Once he got inside her home, he turned nasty, grabbing her and twisting her arm up behind her back though this incident would go a slightly different route to Fraser's previous. After gaining control of the situation and while still physically assaulting the woman, Fraser allowed his victim to call her husband on the phone. Fraser then spoke to the husband, saying, I hope you're not going to kill me. I just wanted to prove a point that somebody could break in and rape your missus. This strange assault and set of actions earned Fraser two months jail time for aggravated assault. Upon leaving jail for this offense, Fraser settled down in Mackay and appeared to be making somewhat of a go of things. He met a woman and settled down with her and her son, eventually fathering a daughter. He also held down a laboring job on the railway for the next two and a half years, things appear to have normalized. In the year of 1985 however, 
it became abundantly clear that none of Fraser's impulses had really disappeared, they had just been hidden. He had begun stalking a 21-year-old woman who walked daily on the isolated beach at Shoal Point, near Mackay. When he felt the time was right, Fraser brutally attacked her, twisting her arm behind her back before viciously raping her. As with all of his previous attacks, it was carried out in broad daylight. As soon as the crime was reported, local law enforcement already had a suspect in mind, Fraser's modus operandi was all over it. He was soon back before the courts and Justice Darrington who sentenced Fraser, said that he was the equivalent of a filthy animal. The judge also expressed his distaste for the way Fraser inferred that his victims enjoyed his actions, saying that he deserved no leniency whatsoever. For this crime, Leonard Frazier was sentenced to 12 years imprisonment. Frazier served his time in Etna Creek Prison in Rockhampton, where he was known by other inmates as Lenny the Loon. This was due to his wild and unpredictable aggressive streak. One minute he would be fine, chattering away, the next minute he would burst out violently, apparently unprovoked. Due to this behavior, the other inmates tended to give him a wide berth. The team behind his parole terms were also wise to his previous sentencing and behavior, so they made sure he was kept in prison for the full 12 years of his sentence, they were steadfast in their belief that he would re-offend as soon as he was set free. Eventually though, the time came for Leonard Frazier to be released into decent society, and in January of 1997, Frazier moved in with a terminally ill woman at Yapoon, near Mackay. The woman had taken up sympathy for Frazier after he told her he was friendless and had nowhere to live. They had previously corresponded while he was in prison. Soon the relationship developed into a sexual one and Frazier became increasingly aggressive. When the woman went to Brisbane for cancer treatment, he followed her and tried to order her home. When she refused, it is alleged that he raped her in the hospital's chapel. The woman died six months later of cancer. From here, Fraser moved on to Mount Morgan, a small mining town located southeast of Yapoon, where he was immediately noticed by the town's residents due to his odd behavior. He could be seen roaming the streets at all hours of the day and night, and a local intellectually disabled woman made a complaint against him to the police, saying that he harassed her on a bus. He would also hang around outside the school at finishing time, trying to engage with any female who walked by, regardless of their age. Near the end of 1998 however, he moved to Rockhampton and set up home with intellectually handicapped 19-year-old, Christine Raitt. When the couple decided to lease a spare room to make some money in April of 1999, a woman and her 11-year-old daughter decided to take them up on the offer. Before long though, she had moved out, citing that Fraser had been interfering with her daughter. Soon after, the couple's landlady kicked Fraser out after she caught him having sex with Raid's Blue Heeler cattle dog in the backyard. On the 22nd of April, 1999, not long after Fraser was accused of interfering with an 11-year-old girl, 9-year-old Kira Steinhardt went missing on her way home from school. Lena Kiernan was an eyewitness to what transpired, and she described a man running up behind little Kira and hitting her hard around the head. When Kira fell to the floor, she could no longer see her, but she saw through the long grass, what appeared to be the assailant moving like he was raping her. The attacker then ran off and returned with a car, before scooping up the little girl's body and putting it into the trunk of the vehicle. Tragically, Lynette was frozen with fear and was terrified by her experience, it took 20 minutes before she reported the crime anonymously to the police. By then it was too late, the 9-year-old little girl was already dead. The next day, Police had traced what they suspected was the vehicle described by their eyewitness. It was a red Mazda 626 being driven by none other than Leonard Frazier. Unusual for him however, it took two weeks before he confessed to the murder, at first denying all knowledge. 
Once he had admitted to his guilt, Fraser took officers to Kira's remains near Rockhampton Racecourse, where she lay naked with her green school jumper laid over her dead body. To silence her with finality, he had cut the little girl's throat. Officers then turned their attentions to Christine Wright, who said she had accompanied Fraser on a drive near the racecourse, on the day that Kira had gone missing. During the drive, Fraser had stopped and told Ems Wright not to watch what he was doing. She did however, and she caught a glimpse of what looked like a blonde doll in school uniform being removed from the car's trunk. Fraser then noticed her watching and returned to the passenger side and punched her in the face through the open window. Ems Wright stopped looking back after that, but she confirmed that when Fraser returned home, he washed the trunk out thoroughly. When police searched the vehicle for trace evidence, they found two samples of blood in the trunk. One consisted of Kira Steinhardt's DNA, and the other was from an unknown female. They also found hair belonging to the little girl. There was also blood on a cigarette paper in the glove box that matched the unknown female. On the 7th of May, 1999, Leonard Frazier was officially charged with the rape and murder of Kira Steinhardt. The case came to court in September of 2000, and the prosecutor put the case forward as the murder of a little girl, for nothing other than sexual gratification. To add to this, he questioned why Frazier had stripped the child naked and why he had hit her so hard that it forced her to the ground. The eyewitness to the terrible events, Lena Kiernan, testified that she had actually seen Frazier stood next to Kira at traffic lights, the day before the murder. This not only showed a certain amount of premeditation, it also tied in with his other stalker-like attributes. The court also heard that nine-year-old Kira had been excited as her parents had only just recently allowed her to make the 30-minute journey home by herself, and that she had said goodbye to her school friends at the gate around 3 p.m. On that day, she had turned off Robinson Street and walked through a vacant lot that was sighted by Bush, before she was violently attacked by Frazier, who knocked her to the ground and raped her. After Frazier had relieved himself of his sexually violent impulse, he hid her body behind a tree while he fetched his vehicle, he also threw her school bag in a different direction, obviously to slow down investigations. Frazier then returned in his red Mazda, placed Kira's body in the trunk, and drove off. The court was then informed that, due to advanced decomposition when she was found, Kira's body was in no state to declare her cause of death, or if she had been sexually assaulted. Leonard Frazier himself, remained silent and appeared untroubled throughout the proceedings. He gave no evidence on his own behalf only speaking to deny all charges in relation to abducting, raping, or murdering Kira. These protestations were rather flimsy however, as when police initially charged him with the offenses, he had offered up this tidbit in the way of an apology or confession. I'd like to say to her mother and father and I know a lot of people won't believe me but, if you check my background, it's not my go to harm a child. I'm just sorry this is happening and I don't know what made me do it, at least I can try to. I'm going to try and get help after I get sentenced and all, so that's a good step. With the staggering amount of evidence put before the court, including DNA and eyewitness testimony, it was no surprise when Leonard Frazier was found guilty on all charges. On November the 9th, 2000, he was sentenced to an indefinite life term. This meant that he would have to appear before a Supreme Court judge and a parole board, before he could ever even be considered for release. This would likely keep him behind bars for the rest of his life. In his summation, Justice Ginn McKenzie had this to say. The offense involved severe, indeed extreme, violence on a child. Fraser's story is that of a sexual predator of the worst kind. This would not be the end of the story as far as Leonard Frazier is concerned though. With the unknown blood in his car, and a series of unsolved disappearances in Rockhampton between September 1998, and April 1999, 
detectives felt there was still a lot more to be unearthed about Fraser. They were right. Authorities suspected that Fraser's hand had been involved in the disappearances of schoolgirl Natasha Ryan, Julie Turner, Beverly Lego, and Sylvia Benedetti. Natasha Ryan was just 14 years old when she disappeared on the 2nd of September, 1998. She had been on her way to the same Rockhampton school that Kira Steinhardt had attended, and thus, police feared that evil Fraser may have taken her life. Julie Dawn Turner went missing on the 28th of December, 1998, and she had numerous ties to Leonard Fraser. On the night in question, Julie had been in attendance at Rockhampton's Airport Liberty nightclub, and was considerably intoxicated when she left. After asking friends for money so that she could get a taxi and failing, 39-year-old Julie started walking and that was the last anyone ever saw of her. Julie's links to Fraser included working with him at the local abattoir, and the fact that she had been telling friends that she was moving in with a guy called Lenny. Another missing woman was Beverly Doreen Lego, 36. She had last been seen on March 1, 1999, at a bank near the East Street Mall, and like Julie Turner, she also had ties to Fraser after staying at a Mount Morgan hostel at the same time as him in 1997. The final woman that police believed may have been a victim of Fraser was 19 year old Sylvia Maria Benedetti. She had disappeared on 17 April, 1999, and while police were still searching for Kira Steinhardt, who had vanished the previous day, they were called to a derelict hotel by the workers on site. In one of the hotel's rooms, number 13, they had made a gruesome discovery. The sight that greeted detectives was unlike any that they had seen before, and the description brings forth the image of a horror movie. There was blood all over the walls and ceiling, with barely a patch untouched. The carpet was noted to be soggy with blood, and bone fragments were found amongst its fibers. When forensic investigators looked downstairs in the hotel, they also found a pair of women's shoes that were submerged in an old freezer full of dank water. When tests proved that the blood in the room was human in nature, police believed that it was likely that of M. Spanadetti. They also believed that they were on the trail of a serial killer. Through investigations the true savagery of the situation hit home, when it was estimated that there had been four liters of blood expunged during the events that had unfolded in room 13. This was the amount that Sylvia Benedetti would have had in her entire body. Authorities believe that Fraser had ties to Benedetti and DNA from the trunk of his car, matched that of the scene at room 13. With all the evidence appearing to point at Fraser, though most of it being circumstantial besides the blood, detectives were desperate to get a solid lead which would help their case. Soon they did, and it came about through Fraser's own confession. The first they heard was from a cellmate of Fraser, who told them that the serial rapist and murderer of a little girl had told him, what I have gone through has caused me to kill these people, and all the hate over the years came to the fore and ended with the murder of the people. When detectives heard this they confronted Frazier and were relatively surprised, when he agreed to take them to where the bodies had been disposed of. After they agreed to take him out of prison discreetly, as apparently Frazier hated the media, they secretly recorded him on video and audio as he took them to the remains of M's Lego, and M's Turner in Rockhampton. Some of M Benedetti's remains had already been found in Bushland near to Sandy Point Beach but Frazier was unable to lead them to any more. Despite this, detectives believe that they now had enough evidence to charge Frazier with multiple counts of murder. Leonard Frazier was brought before trial in April of 2003, and charged with the murders of Natasha Ryan, Julie Turner, Bev Lego, and Sylvia Benedetti. He pleaded not guilty on all counts. Prosecutors first admitted into evidence the boasts with which Frazier was accused. Apparently he told his cellmate that he had murdered Natasha Ryan by stabbing her with a knife, because she was pregnant with his child. 
he supposedly then buried her body just outside Rockhampton. In these conversations he also stated that he had murdered Sylvia Benedetti in a disused hotel, and that he had bled her like an animal, before making a bloody handprint on the wall and smearing over it. Another victim in his alleged jailhouse confession was Julie Turner, who he said slapped him when he put his hand on her leg as he gave her a lift home. After the slap he said that he, flogged into her. The next set of evidence involved the recordings that police had made while Fraser had shown them where he disposed of the women's remains. Whilst showing the detectives the location of what turned out to be M's Lego's body, Fraser told the officers that he couldn't remember who was buried there as his mind was scrambled. He also went on to state that it didn't matter as he would likely spend his life behind bars anyway. The jury was then also allowed to listen to the audio that was taken while Fraser showed detectives the location of M. Turner's remains, which he had unceremoniously disposed of near the Yapoon refuse dump. The next evidence brought before the court, was the DNA tests that now proved that the blood in the hotel room, and that in Fraser's car, belonged to Sylvia Benedetti. Also added to this was the fact that Frazier had been seen seated with M. Benedetti in the mall on April the 18th, right before her disappearance. A shop owner who was located across from the hotel testified that, when he mentioned the hotel's upcoming demolition to Frazier on the 21st of April, Frazier became visibly angry and clenched his fists, saying, they can't do that. The blood-soaked room was discovered shortly after. With the staggering amount of evidence, it would have appeared that the court case was already won before a staggering twist took place. On the 10th of April, 2003, Natasha Ryan, one of the alleged victims of Frazier, was found hiding in a cupboard at her boyfriend's home. Police had been tipped off due to the media focus on the trial. Natasha then refused to speak publicly as the rights for her story were privately auctioned with police stating that they had searched the boyfriend's home when she had gone missing and found not. They also stated that they'd had the home under surveillance for some time after and there had been nothing to infer that Natasha was hiding there. Due to this sudden turn of events, Leonard Fraser's lawyers attempted to have the whole case cancelled. Though the court decided to adjourn for four days and declared Fraser innocent of the Natasha Ryan charges. After the adjournment, the court resumed on the remaining three murder charges. The next round of prosecution evidence came from Alan Quinn, an ex-cellmate of Fraser's who had been secretly recording him on a listening device. He stated before the court that Fraser had often boasted to other prisoners of killing Natasha Ryan, and of several other lies that Fraser perpetrated to inflate his ego. In amongst those lies however, were snippets of truth. One such truth was when, recorded on the listening device, Frazier described the killing of Beverly Lego. Frazier had taken Nam's Lego to Nankin Creek for a swim when, in his own words, I smashed her across the jaw. She was semi-conscious. I pulled the rope that is used for a swing over and put it around her neck twice and tucked the end through the loops and pulled it tight. Frazier then laughed as he added to this, saying, You should have seen her kick when I let the rope go. I heard her neck break. And then she stopped kicking and her legs dangled in the water. It didn't take much to kill her. Because she was really skinny. I took the rope off her and dragged her through the water hole into the long grass where I put her on that ditch. I made sure that I pulled the tall grass back up as I went so there was no trail left behind in the grass. To make sure she was dead, I placed her black sporting briefs around her neck and pulled them tight. So if she woke up she wouldn't breathe, she would die. Also on the secret tape recordings, was Fraser's description of his meeting with Sylvia Benedetti. I took Benedetti to a disused hotel. To room 13 I told her that I had drugs stored there. I tried to kiss her. She didn't like it, he said. I hit her and knocked her out. I went downstairs to check if anyone had heard her scream. 
I went back upstairs and she was just lying there staring at me. When they are unconscious they always stare at you. I knew I was going to be in trouble. So I picked up a block of wood. I thought that it was a block of wood. It could have been a window counterweight, I don't know. But it had serrated edges. The defense for Frazier then brought Natasha Ryan into the equation, the girl he had been accused of killing. She stated before the court, that on the day she went missing, the 31st of August, 1998, she had left school and decided that she would not return after getting in trouble with one of the teachers. She also categorically stated that she had never seen Leonard Frazier in her entire lifetime. The trial then began to draw to a close, although one more strange piece of evidence would make its way to the forefront. From his cell, Frazier had sent police a press release from a Mr. Squeaky. In these releases he gave away intimate details of the crimes and the scenes surrounding them. These included the fact that Em's Lego had been strangled with her underwear, which hadn't been divulged at the time it was received. Also the location of Em's Turner's murder, and the location of her sandals by an electrical box nearby. A subsequent search found a sandal and Em's Turner's bra. The release then went on to state that Mr. Squeaky had committed numerous other crimes in the Rockhampton area including many rapes that had not been reported to the police. Unfortunately for Frazier, the recordings by Alan Quinn captured all of this, as he discussed with his then cellmate how he was trying to lead authorities astray. In the end, Mr. Squeaky's confession only incriminated Frazier further. On the 9th of May, 2003, Leonard John Frazier was found guilty of the murders of Beverly Lego and Sylvia Benedetti. He was also found guilty of the manslaughter of Julie Turner. On the 13th of June, Frazier was sentenced to three more indefinite jail terms, with the judge calling him an untreatable psychopath. On December the 26th, 2003, Leonard Frazier was admitted to hospital after suffering a cardiac arrest. He died five days later on the 31st, peacefully during his sleep.